And today it's my pleasure to welcome back Mary McGraw Gordon. Uh, Mary's been here several times before, and she always delights us with her information and and her delivery. Um, she's the former director of the Family and Outpatient Program at the Betty Ford Center, and Mary is here was here early on to help us look at boundaries and relationships and a whole bunch of other stuff. And they were all quite powerful uh, with life-changing information. Um, but tonight, she's here to help us look at reparenting ourselves. Uh, she wants to show us that we can grow up again. The process is slow, but let's have Mary explain it all to you. Mary, I'm so glad to see you again. It's been a while. You're welcome to jump in. Hey, do you need to, can you unmute? I am now unmuted. Perfect. There. Oh, boy, oh, boy. Look at everybody here. Look around the room, whichever. Look, so we've got seven channels here. So whatever channel you're on, look around the room at all the wonderful people that you are here with today, everybody on a path and a journey of their own. And I just want to um, welcome and respect everybody who showed up here today and who chose to come today. It's your choice to, in on your journey. And I want to give a special thanks, of course, to my daughter, who is a wonderful partner, daughter, adult example of a generational recovery and helped me so much to prepare for today. And we had some funny times there yesterday. And also I want to thank Patrick and Susie, who I know well from the past, but also for putting this on consistently and bringing different speakers and that touch different parts of our and aspects of our, of our recovery. And um, and also there's some special friends that showed up and I want to just a shout out to everybody who showed up. And I promised a few of my <clears throat> recovering friends that I won't swear. <laughs> I'll, I'll do my best not to swear today, but they laughed at me about that. But I will do my best to keep it kind of clean because I'm still growing up too. But I did learn to swear in recovery. And Mrs. Ford did talk about that too. And we'll tell you a little bit about that. And I want to start off before... Peggy and I do the PowerPoint and Peggy will be co-facilitating. So she'll be, you know, fielding some questions and also adding some things as we go along because she has an expertise on the children end of it and some other expertise too. But I want to remember everybody in the field of recovery and addiction who are pioneers and have helped to develop the many resources that we are, that we experience today and that are available to us today. And of course, the founders of Alcoholics Anonymous, Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob and Lois Wilson and Marty Mann and all those beginning pioneers in AA and Al-Anon. And also the Ford family in the 80s, the beginning of the Betty Ford Center and the Hazeltons beginnings back in 1949, Hazelton began in a very, very simple grounded way. And then following all the other centers throughout the country and Europe and in Canada and all different places that have now centers that have helped people to recover from addiction. So I want to honor that. And also in particular, I want to speak very tenderly about Mrs. Ford and Susan Ford. And uh, there's a, one particular friend here who also experienced this. So and she knows who she is. But Mrs. Ford and Susan Ford were often at the center. And one of the things that so helped Betty Ford Center's uh, treatment of addiction was their emphasis on family recovery. It was the gold standard, five days of family program and four days of a children's program. And Peggy certainly can affirm that as others can in this community here today because addiction is a family dis-ease, a family dis-ease, a family not at ease. And then I want to also, so I wanna honor this and kind of dedicate this particular um, presentation to that, 
to the Ford family. And I have a couple of funny stories about that later too. But the other pioneers that I had the privilege of working with and being at workshops with, and also experiencing some of my own personal recovery from ACOA issues, Sharon Workshider Cruz, who developed the experiential model of ACOA treatment. And she, she in particular trained uh, people at the Karen Foundation. And I had the privilege of going there for my own personal recovery from ACOA issues and also got training there to two different types of training on her model and then did that in the in the state of Maine for folks. And then Claudia Black is also an ACOA um, pioneer as, a, as is Ra Raquel Lerner and Robert Ackerman. And also I wanna mention Stephanie Covington who has a wonderful, lots of wonderful literature on the stages of family recovery. And she helped the Ford family and in particular, Mrs. Ford to develop the women's uh, treatment at Betty Ford Center, because women's recovery is different than men's recovery. And this is a little funny story about her. Some of the men that were, uh, you know, they use the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and the 12 and 12 at Betty Ford Center and many, many treatment centers, not all, but many. And um, when Stephanie Covington was creating her, helping Mrs. Ford to create the women's program there, she told, uh, the, the, one of the guys asked her, well, you know, they're using the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and Stephanie Covington said, that's great. And I think you ought to in also include a women's uh, concept of the 12 steps and uh, ought to have the men read the women's concept. Of the <laughs> and I don't know, I think the guy had a reaction to that, but She's another one that's a pioneer. So, I mean, I just think that we all walk on the shoulders of a lot of people that came before us, and I certainly do. And then um, before we go into the presentation, one of my favorite authors is Alice Walker. One of her books, Beside the Color Purple, which many people are familiar with, is The Temple of My Familiar. And in The Temple of My Familiar, one of the lines, and I tried to find it in the book, but I couldn't, but this isn't the exact line. But it was about families, and it was in particular about knowing our own families. And she said, find out everything you can about your family. Go back and ask people, if they're still alive, about particular things about your parents, your grandparents, your aunts, your uncles, depending on the size of your family. And even if you're adopted or you're a foster kid or you were come from a one parent family. It doesn't matter. Just try to find out about your ancestors as much as possible. And that will give you a glimpse of who you are. Know everything, even simple things like what was the color of the cars that they bought? If they had cars, did they buy a particular type of car? I mean, and I thought at first, I thought, well, that's kind of silly. But then after I started asking some of my own large extended family on the Italian side, a little bit on the Irish side, not so much on the Irish side, because a lot of them died of alcoholism. But I started asking questions and I found out some amazing things. So we we have that in our souls, our ancestral uh, legacy. So with that being said, and having you all looked around the room at who's here, I think Peggy and I are ready to do our presentation. And then we will move on from there. Okay. So this is this is about all of us. And um, reparenting ourselves. And look at those joyful little faces. And just remember you were a kid once, a little kid. No matter what the family you came from, you were a little kid. And now you're on a journey of recovery of some kind. I don't know in particular what your journey is about. We are talking about addiction here. We're talking about growing up in a family where one or more parents were addicted. If your direct parents weren't addicted, perhaps your grandparents, uncles, different people in your family, you were impacted by addiction. So reparenting ourselves is the cornerstone of recovery. So we're gonna talk some more about that. Let's look at this, oh, I love this quote, you can read that. And the, and the only comment I want to make about that quote is, thank God I live in a community where there's a lot of little kids. 
And I love seeing those little kids bouncing around and they're different ages, you know, but the littlest ones are the most innocent ones. So one day I was out on my back patio and there's three of, three of them that go with their mama to either daycare or kindergarten. Avery, Alexander, and um, what's the third one's name? Avery, Alexander, anyway, whatever the third one's name. So they were walking one day and they get in line behind their mama. So anyway, they were going out and I, I always say hi to them and try not to disturb the order that mama has them in. So one day, and they're usually smiling and they may, might be chattering, but this one particular day, they were going out and they looked very solemn. Their faces were not smiling. And I thought, oh, oh something's up. So Alexander looked over at me. He saw me out on the back patio and he just looked and glanced and he said, there's trouble. <laughs> so I didn't inquire. I didn't interfere. And then later on, he told me somebody forgot their sweater and they must have gotten a little talking to by mama. So then the next day they were smiling again. So I looked over at Alexander and I said, any trouble today? And he said, no trouble. <laughs> so that's a, there's a different way that kids look at the world. And we need to remember that we have that within us too. Why do we reparent ourselves? This, this says, you know, if you have children, they may be grown and have families of their own. Even if you don't have kids and you are grown, um, you're in recovery. Isn't that enough? You're going to AA meetings. Isn't that enough? I'm sober. I'm 40 or fill in the blank how old you are. What do you mean I have to reparent myself? And what does growing up mean to me? I'm sober now. Well, we're going to talk about that some more. Okay. Getting what we missed. So we don't have to go on living without what we need now. Now I want to add something to this. There's a wonderful book put out by... Um, Thomas Keating, who was a, a Trappist monk, he's now dead, but he did he does a lot with centering prayer, and some of you may already know his literature and so forth. But he talks about, a lot about in the beginning when he's interviewed by a 12-stepper, and he's talking about the steps, and he talks about everybody, no matter if they're in recovery or have an addiction, everybody has missed out on something earlier in their life. There's nobody that comes from a perfect family. There's nobody that comes from a family that hasn't had some wounds. The wounds could be ancestral wounds. The wounds could be current wounds. There's some things missing, some trauma that may have happened. So everybody has something that's missing. And a quick story about when I was lecturing on the patients one day over at Betty Ford Center, 200 patients there in the room. And I usually, you know, I did a thing on the family. Uh, resiliency in the, in the lecture. And I encourage all of them to, of course, support their families coming to the family program. So then I always ask the question, is there anybody here who has come from a perfect family? Please raise your hand. Thinking, of course, nobody's going to raise their hand. But front row and center, guy raised his hand. <laughs> so I thought, okay, well, that's what he he believes and thinks. And then I asked him after the whole lecture was over, I said, how long have you been here at Betty Ford Center? And he, one day, and he was still detoxing. So you see, he was still clearing away. And there is no way that anybody just detoxing from alcohol can even uh, imagine that they missed out on anything earlier. They're just surviving and trying to get well. So there's perspective there. Okay. So we're going to talk about repairing one small corner of a large hole in our hearts. And we all have large holes in our hearts. Some of you have repaired some of those holes in your heart. And we'll talk about how that look, what that looks like too. Okay. Many of us in recovery have broken dreams. We've had hearts broken and we have broken people's hearts. We have had missed connections and all of that takes time. And I don't care how long or short you've been in recovery. It takes, still takes time because sometimes I'll hear somebody who's got, you know, it's got a fair amount of time in, in sobriety. They're going faithfully to their meetings. They have a sponsor, they're working the steps, but then they have a, some kind of a reaction to something. And then they talk about, they either share in a meeting or they might share in, with their sponsor. 
oh, how come I'm still whatever, fill in the blank? Because it takes time. And it also takes the learning of new skills. Because I keep, if I keep doing the same thing over and over again, and expecting different results, that's a form of insanity too. And whenever you're projecting something out to somebody else, it's the part that you need to repair in yourself. We're always reparenting ourselves. We may not call it that when we're at a meeting or with our sponsor or working a step, but we're always reparenting. So that's where we start. Now, and Peggy, because um, we talked about this yesterday, may you may add some things to this, but we're going to be talking about developmental ages and stages. And this literature, by the way, uh, you don't really have to take notes because we're going to get, if you need to, we'll, we'll pass out, or give Patrick handouts. But also there's, a, there's some resources at the end that where this literature was taking, taken from. So a developmental stage is a describable se segment of growing up as particular ages. The person is busy with age appropriate tasks that help answer three important questions. And here they are. So when you're going through different stages, and we're going to talk about those, who am I? Who am I in relation to others? This is how those little kids that were going off to school and, and uh, daycare, they were identifying who they were, lined up going with their mama. And who am I in relation to others? Well, we're in trouble today. So the whole line of them had the frown on their face. So they had they went as a little group. And then how do I acquire the skills that I need? And that's the whole the whole part about reparenting that's so important for all of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to add, I think it's important to understand why we're looking at developmental stages. Um, because in order to really comprehend, like why do we need to grow up again or reparent ourselves, um, we have to really look at these stages. Um, because what happens with the theory of child development is that there are certain needs, uh, emotional needs, and certain skills that we need to learn at certain uh, times in our development. And often in families where there's uneven parenting, um, which happens, which actually addiction uh, contributes to that, um, us as children, we were not supported through these stages. So we didn't learn the skills that we needed. Um, maybe we didn't have the structure we needed or we didn't have the nurture that we needed. And both of those things are really important. Um, so for example, as children, we may not have had the nurturing of unconditional love. We may not have received messages that said that we were lovable just the way we are, or that um, even if we made mistakes, we were still uh, loved. So in order to move forward and provide ourselves with that kind of, with, we need to move forward and provide ourselves with that kind of love that we may have missed out on as children. And additionally, if we didn't have the structure, um, there wasn't structure in place that helped us to learn uh, skills that we needed, that's often what we need to go back and revisit as adults. So hopefully- Yeah, I'm Peggy, I want to add what you said there. And this is something that uh, we discussed as we were preparing yesterday. And, and at Betty Ford Center in the family program, we never called family members dysfunctional. If you're using that language, please stop using that language. And the reason is all families are functioning. They just may be functioning in pain. Mm -hmm. And as Peggy said, when we get to talking about what you, tasks need to happen to reparent yourself, uh, there's an uneven parenting when you have alcoholism in your family. And the other thing, and I don't know that you mentioned this, and if you did, I apologize that I'm repeating it. But in different families, let's say you had several people in your family of origin that you grew up with, several other siblings. Well, each one of those siblings is coming into a different family because if addiction is present and they may, and let's say the first child comes in and the addiction is not far advanced as in the last child coming in, there's going to be a different experience there. So some of the skills may have already been learned by that the oldest child 
but the youngest child may have missed it. And yet, so the cycle is different for each child. So we're going to call it uneven parenting. And, and I often have, and we'll, we'll go on to this one too, but I often have the other piece, and that isn't when I'm talking to my colleagues who are also counselors and therapists in the field, that the, the, the term dysfunctional or path, pathologizing families is not helpful. And so when family members would come into the family program at Betty Ford Center, because they'd come in and they would be in pain. And sometimes I would hear this and I would hear this in the in 12 step programs where people, oh, yeah, the families are sicker than the, the patients. Let's stop doing that to families. The families are coming in and they're hurting and they're pained. They're in pain. So let's talk about what are the stages that maybe anybody in, in any family missed out at, and remembering that the parents came from a family too. So uh, Peggy, um, do you wanna go ahead through these developmental stages? Um, sure, so the developmental stages are, like we said, segments of time. And um, there's certain needs that each developmental stage uh, requires. So um, in stage one, which is birth to six months, we call that the being stage. And what that means is, you know, as a baby, we're learning. Is it okay for me to be here? Is it okay to make my needs known? Um, you know, so that's the time when uh, there's a lot of nurturing, when it's important for as a child that we're, that we're bonded with uh, that parent figure. Um, stage two, which is six to 18 months, is the doing stage. Um, and I'm sure anybody who's had children six to 18 months know what's happening. Well, they're exploring their environment. They're trying new things and they're learning to trust themselves. Um, you know, but when you look at that stage too, it's important not only to have that nurture, but also structure. Because one of those things that we notice um, that I always notice when I go to somebody's home that has a child that age is the, the plugs in the wall. You know what? There's We have to make sure that's safe. So, um, you know, a little a little toddler doesn't put their finger in there. So not only are you nurturing, but you're providing structure. Um, you're trying to let go of some of that um, freedom as a parent to allow uh, your child to sort of learn and grow new things. And um, stage three, uh, 10 months to three years, um, that's the thinking stage. Um, so is it okay for me to learn to think for myself? Because now we're kind of moving away and, um, you know, I always hear the terrible twos and, you know, kids that age, they're, they're testing. Um, you know, what happens if I, if I try something and I get hurt? Is there somebody there to nurture me? Is there somebody there um, to let me know, hey, you can, you, maybe it didn't work this time, but moving forward. Let's try it again. So again, having both nurture and structure there. Um, stage three is 10 months to three years. Um, oh, I just did that one. Stage four is three to six years, identity and power. So again, we're seeing sort of a move toward more independence. So is it okay to for me to be who I am with my unique abilities? Is it okay for me to find out who others are? and learn from the consequences of my actions. So um, this is also a really important time when kids are not just looking at themselves, but how, how do I make friends? Who am I in relation to others? Um, is it okay for me um, to try new things and, and um, you know, do some thinking on my own? Um, what is my identity? So kids start to become really aware of who they are and their relation um, to other, other kids their own age. Um, and then we move on to the structure stage, which is stage five, which is ages six to 12 years old. Um, and this stage um, is actually one of my favorites um, because uh, when I was working at the Betty Ford Center, uh, what I did was I worked in the children's program. Um, I worked with Jerry Moe, as some of you probably know who he is. 
Um, and we did a four day program. And one of the most important things about that program was providing kids with structure. Um, and that's what kids learn in school. You know, how do I build an internal structure? How do I develop uh, my social skills? Um, and how do I develop those social sk skills in relation to my environment? Um, you know, one of the things too about the stage is uh, kids are learning a lot. And, um, you know, one of the things that, that I noticed in working with children in the children's program is that, you know, we had a lot of kids that were referred to us from, 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 you know, a counselor, psychologist, or the parent that was just like, my child's out of control. I, you know, I, I there's, they must have oppositional defiant disorder. Um, and then really what's happening is I always like to ask the question, are they having problems at school? Well, no, school is, you know, schools, they're, they're fine at school. It's just at home. <laughs> well, if you think about what happens at school, there is a structure in place. Yeah. And um, that structure is really important for kids in this age range. Sometimes when, when we're growing up in homes where there's alcoholism or addiction, uh, we don't have that structure. We may not, we may have rules that are sometimes enforced, sometimes not. Um, so it can become really confusing. Um, so yeah, that's a really important thing um, for this particular age. And then stage six 12 to 19 years old is identity, sexuality, and separateness. Um, how do I become my own person with my own values? Um, is it okay for me to be independent and honor my sexuality, but still be responsible? And, um, you know, that's something that uh, not, only not only parents or family can help with, but as, you know, teenagers, we learn from our community, we learn from our peers, Hopefully we, we can learn about some of this in school. Um, and stage seven is adult, the adult stage, and that's interdependence. So how do I balance my own needs for competence, intimacy, connectedness, and separateness with the demands of caring for others? Because it can be really hard as an adult, here you are, you're a parent, you're working, um, you know, whatever it may be. And what happens is we often neglect ourselves the most. Um, and stage eight, the, is still the adult stage, but that's integration. Um, how do I complete the meaning of my life and prepare for leaving? <clears throat> and I just think about this stage too, as, um, you know, I, I'm just thinking about my, my father who has, you know, we, we've sat down, we've, we've done his, we've sat and done his obituary and he's talked about what are, what's his legacy? What is it, what is it important for people to remember about him? And that's sort of that developmental stage of being an adult and sort of integrating your life. Um, now, but, before, yeah. Before you go on, I just wanted, there was just something that, thank you for that part, but I want to kind of go back when you were talking about the kids mm -hmm. and developing competency and social skills, a couple little <laughs> stories about, because the family program was in a particular building, Pork family building, and the, the children's was in a different building. Well, it, late in later stages. But I remember when uh, if Peggy and uh, Jerry would bring the kids over, and they'd be over in the in the uh, in a different building. And I remember Mrs. Ford came in to speak to the patient. So she was walking through, and she had the Secret Service with her. Now the kids were all there and Jerry uh, said to the kids that were there, do you know who that is? Meaning Mrs. Ford. Now the kids don't know who Mrs. Ford is and they don't really care, I guess. <laughs> and so, no, I don't know. And then Jerry would say who she was and then she walked in and to do her, her little talk. But then they focused on the secret service people. And then one got a kid looked up at the secret service and says, do you have a gun? <laughs> and it's just like that present moment of kids. And that whole thing about competency and social skills and learning how to live in a culture. Kids are in the moment so much. And so many of those kinds of interactions throughout the day with kids and their families really show you what the particular developmental stage that kid is at. And one other story, when I was crossing over to go over to the other building where the kids were, and this little kid was getting ready to go eat. And I don't know, I just said, Hi, Johnny, how's it going? And she, he looked right up at me. He said, do you know my sister? 
And I said, no, I don't know your sister. Well, how did you know my name? And I said, well, you have your name tag on. And it was the sweetest little thing because he just made the association since I called his name that I must know his sister. So social skills and competency in demonstrated on a daily basis when those kids were going through there. So I don't know. Did you want to do anything more with stage eight, Peggy, or you want to go to the next? No, okay. no. All right. I just I did just want to mention that you know I, it, the reason why we wanted to look at these developmental stages is yeah. as you're listening to this presentation to start thinking about mm-hmm. what you what you received as a child in a particular stage and what you didn't receive and how that might impact you now as an adult. Um, you know, so for example, uh, when I grew up. Uh, you know, my mom struggled with alcoholism. Um, so, you know, what did I miss, uh, miss when, while I was growing up and how do I repair some of that as an adult, you know, and that can be hard work and it can be really hard to look at, um, you know, remembering what it was like as a kid. Yeah. And, and, you know, I want to add to that too, Peggy, because oftentimes you'll hear it and you'll hear it in 12 step groups, or you'll hear it in, you know, maybe when you're talking to your sponsor, my parents did the best they could. And um, it's sort of a, sort of a resignation statement. And I always like to add to that. They did the best they could and it wasn't enough. So now it's your responsibility to start to repair and grow up in the places, in the different places that you missed. Now, of course, working the steps, you're gonna repair, you know, do the amends process and and do um, living amends and start to look at forgiveness and all the things that the steps teach when you practice those steps. Mm -hmm. But remember, they did the best they could and it wasn't enough. And in some cases, when people experience, uh, experience extreme abuse, abandonment, Etc. There's also more to repair in that department. So thanks for that, Peggy. That was good. All right. All right. This is the, as Peggy spoke about nurture and structure, all children need nurture, which is the gentle side of care. I unconditionally love you. You don't have to be or do anything different than who you are as a, as a child in a different stage in your development. Words, touch, and care are also another form of, of uh, gentle side of care. Assertive care is being able to be real clear about what the rules are in the house, for instance, or keeping a child safe. When Peggy talked about, you know, plugging in those uh, outlets, that's assertive care right there. And supportive care is is emotionally supporting a child when they're hurting and, and also emotionally supporting them if they're angry about something or if they're if they're using behavior that needs correction that's also supportive care and then of course attention and contact now one of the things i noticed of course we're we're in an age of a high technology and people with their cell phones and i've noticed this a lot and i don't know it, there's no judgment out on this there's just a reality is i see sometimes young mothers they get their babies there. And they I love the little, little strollers they have now where the babies can look right at the mother. But the mother's on the looking at the cell phone the whole time pushing. So I hope sometimes they put their cell phones down and make eye contact because that's so important. Children need to see us and hear us. So attention and contact, that's another nurturing part. All right. Now, Peggy spoke about structure, which is the firm side of care. We all need that. And also when in our discussion yesterday, Peggy and I talked about how 12 step programs offer that structure for people. Um, so it's the firm side of care in it, developmentally for children and for adults. We learn how to think clearly when we're in it, when we're guided uh, by structure in our families. We learn how to assess information, to identify options, set goals, organize, start, and do and complete tasks. Now, uh, let's talk, Peggy, do you want to add to this? Because we talked about like when you go to a 12-step meeting, let's say you're going for the first time, you're a newcomer. What does the newcomer get? They get that the, that the meeting starts on time. And just like Patrick and Susie started this meeting on time, they assigned hope to the, the particular prayer she was going to read. They told 
people about the structure of this meeting. So that helps people. That's a form of reparenting already that they did right prior to us starting this meeting. And the same thing when you're going to your regular 12-step meetings, wherever they are or whatever they are, AA, Al-Anon, if you're going to any um, sex anonymous meetings, uh, debtors anonymous, all the different 12-step meetings, you're going to know that that meeting starts on time, it ends on time. They'll, they usually do a preamble of some kind and tell you what it's all about. And it, it gives the person a feeling of safety. It's like, okay, I know. And when that doesn't happen, what happens within us, especially if we come from an alcoholic family, is that disturbance within. Oh, it's not starting on time. I'm feeling a little anxious. Or, oh, this is not done the way I usually experience it. All that you have to remember about that is that, oh, okay, I'm going to have to reparent myself about that. And you won't use that language particularly, but we're going to talk about that later too. So nurture and structure. Thanks, Peggy. And here in, in healthy families, now I want to, to just divert here a little bit. Families are not necessarily uh, the family you grew up with or the family you currently have. Families can be a, a whole multi-dimensional uh, kind of uh, connection. And you may have added people to your family. You may have Pets in your family, you may have neighbors in your family system. In other words, it's the connection you make in the community. Sometimes people talk about their a their their home group, their home AA group as their family. Now it's not family in the traditional sense, but it certainly is connection. So in healthy families, there's an appreciation shown to one another, validating each other and mutually supporting each other. Spending time together while respecting boundaries, space, and privacy. Now, here's something I want to mention about this. Not necessarily everybody, and I remember coming to some of my when I first got sober, coming to some meetings in Maine. It was a little different there than it is in California, of course. But different cultures. And, and at this meeting today, we have cultures from all over the world. So of course, you adapt it to whatever your culture allows. But respecting boundaries, space, and privacy means you don't automatically go up and hug somebody at, at the 12-step meeting that you're at because they're a newcomer. You have to respect boundaries and ask people, is it okay if I give you a hug? Is it okay if I do this? Because they deserve that, number one. And, and it's intrusive. And that's a whole thing on boundaries that we could go into, and we're not going to do that today. But Healthy families do spend time together and healthy families communicate effectively about their feelings and their needs. Okay. Healthy families also work together. Okay. I talked about boundaries, space, and privacy. And I want to mention something. I grew up in a large family, Irish and Italian, and sarcasm was used a lot. Now, when I started to do my ACOA work, one of the things I learned about sarcasm in families Sarcasm means to tear flesh in Greek. And I learned that actually in an al meeting. So it's hurtful. Now that doesn't mean playfulness or the sort of you know humorous type of thing, but I'm talking about real sarcasm or dripping sarcasm. You can feel it. That is not respectful. And some of you may kind of, when you hear that, you may think, oh, I've done that before. And I know when I heard that, I thought, oh no, that's not, that's just being funny or that's just being Italian, or that's just being, I, I fill in the blank for ethnicity or whatever. But just remember that it could be very, very hurtful. And then healthy families have a strong sense of meaning and purpose, and they deal with crisis in a positive way, responding rather than reacting. Mm -hmm. And responding simply is take a breath, hmm, rather than reacting to something. And usually if we're reacting to something so strongly, we're, we're throwing out our projections onto people, you know, our fear, our doubt, our insecurity, whatever it is. And so in a healthy, now no family is going to be totally balanced all the time and there's no perfect family, but you will, over the course of recovery, we, and as people get weller, they will deal with crisis in a more positive way, or they'll have at least one member that can deal in a more positive way and respond rather than react. All right. 
Do you want to say anything about this one, Peggy? Well, I think it's just what we've been talking about, um, you know, that the, the really important balance between nurture and structure um, and what can happen when we don't have that. And, you know, without one or, or, or the other, um, we cannot, you know, maybe as children, we didn't learn boundaries. We, we, and so, you know, as an adult, we really struggle with, you know, setting boundaries with other people, uh, or maybe we violate others' boundaries because we never learned that as we were growing up because maybe ours weren't respected. Mm. Um, so there's, you know, there's an imbalance when we miss out on some of these tasks of developmental stages. Um, so it's, it's really important to take a look at that. I mean, I know for myself, um, you know, what I, I learned growing up in, in an alcoholic home was that as the oldest child, it was my job to look after everybody. Mm. Um, you know, my brother, my younger brother, my younger sister, my parents. Um, and, you know, as an adult, um, what I learned that, you know, I, as an adult, I can, I struggle with being playful. Um, I have to really, you know, be mindful of, I don't have to say yes to everything mm -hmm. and remind myself that it's not my job anymore um, to look after everybody in my family. And actually a lot of people in my family don't want me to do that. They find it really annoying. <laughs> um, so, you know, that's just an example of work that I had to do to reparent myself um, because I missed that when I was growing up. Yeah, that's so, excellent, Peggy. Yeah. And I like the, the uh, what I also like about this particular quote, and you'll see what it's from here. All nurture and little structure make a floppy boundary weak child and adult. So sometimes people who are early in recovery and they have ch little children, they go all out to, oh, now I got to make up for everything I wasn't there for. And so I'm going to give them everything they need now. And that makes a boundary weak child and adult and also an overindulged child. But all structure and little nurture result in stiffness. And mm -hmm. I, I like what you said there about the playfulness piece. And the, and the thing about that is we all need balance. And it's just, again, like if we're way too serious about anything, then that's why sponsorship and that's why going to meetings. And that's why going to counseling, going to some therapeutic modality over time. And I, I, even in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, it talks about outside help. I think that everybody could use a little bit of outside help from time to time. So, and that's a form of reparenting too. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that slide. Okay. Oh, yes. We are going to focus on stage five in general terms here. You want to add to that, Peggy? Because we talked about this yesterday. Too. Well, we chose to. What what it what we felt it was important to do is because there's so much involved in these stages is to just pick one stage of development and look at um, what that looks like and um, how we might uh, become aware that we need to reparent ourselves in that in that area. So yeah. we chose the structure stage, which is the developmental stage five. And that's ages six to 12. So this does not mean what you're doing. If you are currently parenting kids, this does not mean what you're going to be. It, I mean, it gives you the general picture of what the job of the child is, but this is the job of you. As Peggy said, this is what you may have missed in six to 12. This is the structure part of this stage of development. So you, as a child in that age bracket, will have learned skills, learn from your mistakes, decide to be adequate, et cetera. You can read them all on your own. Now, remembering that if you grew up in a family of uh, addiction, and also as a general rule, other families that were disorganized, but addiction in particular offers, you know, people different experiences, more survival skills rather than the kinds of structure mm -hmm. talked about here. Yeah. And I wanted to say too, um, you know, with, with this particular, your job as a child that maybe um, you didn't learn, um, you know, for example, check, to check our family rules and learn about structures outside of the family. Um, you know, I think the rules in my family 
uh, were, you know, we're not talking about the problem at, yeah. at home. We don't talk about feelings. Um, and, you know, that, that makes it really difficult. Uh, and again, so what that means is as an adult, yeah. I needed to relearn those skills. Yeah. And, and Peggy, what you brought up also there about family rules in an alcoholic family, alcoholic families learn, don't talk, don't trust, don't feel. Mm -hmm. So when you go outside structure, your kids are going to school or they're going to church or, or the different other organizations outside the family. And somebody says, you know, what's wrong? Are you, you okay? Oh, oh I'm okay. I'm totally okay. Whereas when, you were working in the children's program and working with kids and then the family program, they start to talk, trust and feel, and they learn to cope uh, that they didn't cause the disease. They can't control it. They can't cure it, but they can cope. And that is, those are skills too, too. And to, for a kid to learn and for any adult in the family, let's say they were a young adult or a teenager in the family to learn that they didn't cause their parents addiction, no matter how, if they, acted out or no matter if they didn't uh, do what they were told or whatever, that did not cause the parent to drink. But kids do take that on, believe, they, believe me, they do. So that's good, that jobs of the child. Okay, now these, when we, when we discussed it yesterday, this is for all of you who are here today to look at. These are the clues that you need to grow up again. So if you have to be a part of a gang or only functioning well as a lunar, loner, a lunar, <laughs> and not understanding the relevance of rules or guidelines. Sometimes, for instance, when uh, we mentioned about when you go to AA meetings or Al-Anon or any of the 12 step meetings, there's you know certain rules. There are. Um, you know, you show up on time, you show up on time, you be of service, etc. And sometimes people will be rebellious. And when people are being rebellious or they'll say, oh, I've always been a re rebel. What they're talking about is that they didn't get that particular stage clear, six to 12. So they think it's okay to keep doing that throughout the, their lives. Mm -hmm. Now we're not, again, this is about balance. So uh, obviously there are times when it's a good idea to rebel against something that is is awful and negative and so forth. But we're talking about just in general. So not understanding the relevance of rules, not understanding freedom that rules can give, and then unwillingness to examine own values and morals. Now, I want to try to refer to some literature here, if I can think of what the whole, yeah, well, of course, in, in Alcoholics Anonymous, there's, it says, we are not saints. And the other thing is that addiction is not a moral issue. People are not bad people who pick up alcohol and become alcoholics. Now, I know you, most people here know that, but there's still some internal things that people take on that think, oh, you know, I have to do an inventory. So that means I was a bad person. No, no. But if you have a total unwillingness to examine your own values and morals, then you, then you have to take a look at that. And that is a developmental issue too. Mm -hmm. Needing to be the center of attention. Needing, you know, if you, wherever. And trusting the thinking of others more than trusting your own thinking or intuition. Peggy, do you want to expand on that? Because we talked a little bit about that intuition. Yeah, that, that one really stands out to me um, because I think that what happens um, in families where there's addiction is that it's really confusing. And there's a lot of mixed messages, um, you know, you know, you know, one day it might be fine um, to do one thing, but then the next day it's not. Yeah. Um, and so what happens is we can, we can grow up really not trusting ourselves. Um, and, you know, I, I think of it in terms of relationships uh, that sometimes as adults, we get into a relationships where, you know, there's something in our gut that just says, you know what, I, I don't know about this person, but then we ignore that and say, you know what, no, I don't know what I'm talking about. You know, I'm just going to move forward. And sometimes we end up with toxic 
people in our lives. Yeah. So, you know, that's one of the things that really stands out for me um, that it's really important to take a look at. And, and, you know, when we get into recovery, that's one of the things that we're encouraged to look at is, you know, who do you have around you? Do you have supportive people? Um, can you trust yourself to know what you need? Um, so yeah, that's really important. Yeah. And then the last one being reluctant to learn new things and be productive. And remember in the book that was written year, years and years ago, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, it says, we realize we know only a little. God will constantly reveal to us more. And the thing about that is this field of addiction and recovery has grown. Now, we're, I'm talking specifically, Peggy and I are referring specifically to from the professional standpoint of helping people who are in recovery, but also thinking in terms of the whole audience here today of people being 12 steppers and in recovery. If you're reluctant to new to learn new things or be productive, you may that may be a clue that you need to grow up again and reparent yourself. So let's go on to the next one. Okay. Now this is just these are just some examples of sort of self-talk, or you could also talk it over with your sponsor, your friend in AA, whatever. How do you support your reparenting process in this knowing that some of those uh, from this stage uh, address that particular stage. I can think before I say yes or no and learn from my mistakes. If you're always saying yes and you are reluctant to say no to things, then there's some, then you're not coming from necessarily the adult place. I can trust my intuition to help decide what to do. And Peggy gave a good example of that trusting your intuition. And again, in the promises of, of in the big book, we will intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle us. Now, if something is baffling us, that, that then we can go to our support people in our circle and run it by them and listen, and then trust the intuition if what their guidance feels, yeah, that's right, that feels right for me. But if it doesn't, we don't follow that either. And I like what you said about that, Peggy, just trusting that intuition. And lastly, I can find a way of doing things that works for me. Now, there are many more affirmations to support reparenting. These are just a few examples. Do you want to add anything to that, Peggy? Um, no, I think you 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 covered it. Um, yeah, I mean, and sometimes uh, I think as mom had mentioned, you know, we grow up in families where there's a lot of trauma um, and, you know, we do need some outside help. And it's important, you know, to not necessarily just rely on 12 step meetings, yeah. um, but be open to exploring some of these things um, in therapy or counseling or, or a group process or whatever works for you. Yeah, that's a good one. Okay. And then there's, we're just continuing now with um, some oh, more yeah. of the affirmations. I can learn rules that help me live with others. Um, I can learn when and how to disagree, um, you know, and, and a lot of times in, in families where there was addiction, maybe you saw really volatile um, interactions um, when there were disagreements, or maybe there was silent anger in your house, oh, yeah. Yeah, but there yeah. was no disagreeing, but you never actually heard anybody disagreeing. Um, and that's, that's a skill that really needs to be learned. If you didn't see that as a child, um, then how do you manage to do that as an adult? And then I can think for myself and get help instead of staying in distress, you know, and, and if you look at, you know, some, some folks, you know, struggling to stop drinking, for example, or they want to maintain sobriety, but they're saying to themselves, I can do this myself. Yeah. I don't need help. Um, again, looking back, why do I say that to myself? Uh, did I learn in my family that it wasn't okay to ask for help? Is that a sign of weakness? So these are things that you can explore um, as you look at reparenting yourself. Yeah. And now I want to add to that one thing. Can you go back a minute? Oops, sorry. That's all right. Go back to the one about, I can learn when and how to disagree. Now, the thing about, again, as Peggy pointed out, either if you're not going to outside help or when you do or whatever, 
uh, also learn even within the structure of your 12 step groups. You, you don't have to agree with everybody, but you also don't have to be disagreeable all the time. <laughs> so, the, the, you know, in other words, balance, all of these affirmations are about balance as you support yourself. And you don't have to be correct and right all the time. In other words, that's a grow, kind of a grown up thing to know that other people, get, letting other people be who they are while you are allowing yourself to either agree or disagree with them. So again, we're talking here about balance as you reparent. All right, now we'll go to the next. Okay. That's a good one. All right, so we have some guiding questions as we, now Peggy, just remind me, did we, um, am I gonna do that exercise after the whole thing or no? Nope, um, we're gonna open it up for questions. And oh, yeah. I would, you know, these are, these are some pretty um, broad questions. I'm, I'm actually going to turn off the PowerPoint and post these questions in the chat so folks can look at it. Um, but just kind of reflecting back on the, the PowerPoint, the presentation and think, you know, pick one of these questions and think about it.